Hello, everyone. Welcome to the LockingYourSuccess.com Trading Performance Podcast, where it's all about real traders, real problems, and real coaching. Today, I have a special treat for you. I'm speaking with Jared Tendler, and Jared is a leading expert on how your mental game impacts performance. He works with some of the top poker players in the world, as well as athletes, PGA Tour uh, players, and of course, financial traders. Uh, Jared is also, also the author of The Mental Game of Trading. He does a personal performance coaching. And I believe I also saw a trading psychology masterclass uh, out on the internet there. So uh, let's uh, welcome Jared. Hello. Yeah. Thanks, John. Good to, good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, could you maybe start by telling us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in performance coaching? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of uh, it came out of my own uh, desire to solve my own problems. I think like a lot of people, you know, sort of the uh, entrepreneurial dilemma, right? Kind of finding a better mousetrap sort of scenario where for me, it was sports psychology in the late nineties, trying to help me overcome some issues, trying to be a, become a professional golfer. And, uh, you know, I was, I got good pretty quickly. And I think that, uh, basically put me in, in, into situations where I wasn't quite mentally prepared to handle them, but didn't know that at the time and ended up choking. So for example, in 1997, tried to qualify for the U S open and played some of the best golf of my life, but missed a bunch of short putts, which was where the pressure kind of got to me. And dove into sports psychology looking for answers and found that it generally helped, except in those moments where it mattered most, right? In some of these big, big tournaments. And I was a, an All-American uh, for Division Three Skidmore in upstate New York, won nine tournaments in college. So I could handle that kind of pressure, but, you know, sort of the big national stages where I struggled and sports psychology for me just wasn't helping me. And I kind of went and got a degree in counseling psychology. So technically I'm a licensed therapist, but I never practiced. I went to get educated over four years, two years in getting a master's degree, two years getting licensed to learn sort of the skills of a therapist to kind of dig into problems to understand kind of more what was going on and then kind of combine that with the traditional sports psychology to eventually develop my own system, which is uh, reflected in my first poker book, which came out 10 years ago. And then uh, the mental game of trading, which came out uh, last last April. I heard that you recently done one of the, one of the largest research surveys uh, ever conducted about me- the mental factors in, in trading performance. And I was wondering if you could tell us about that. Yeah. So last November, I uh, conducted this with, I think, like 12 or 13 other kind of trading entities uh, around the trading community case. I wanted to make sure that it wasn't kind of a biased sample of just kind of my audience and people that uh, interact with me through Twitter, through newsletter, et cetera. Um, we got over 13, uh, 1,200 respondents, almost 1,300 respondents uh, from around the world. Um, you know, demographics wise, uh, you know, about 90% men, 10% women. Uh, but what we found, and, and the age groups were pretty stratified from, you know, kind of 24 up to 75, you know, with the, the average being around, you know, kind of 45, 50 years old. But what we found is that the results that I'll, I'll tell you in a second kind of held up across demographics. Didn't matter how, uh, how old you were, didn't matter what, what your gender was uh, or where you lived, uh, this pattern generally held. And so it, we we're trying to kind of figure out the general perception about trading psychology um, in, in the trading community. And 96% of traders believe that psychology has value. 95% of traders can see when their emotions are affecting their trading decisions in real time. But only 50, excuse me, only 34% of traders can act, actually believe that they have a system to be able to handle and manage their emotions uh, pragmatically. Kind of, uh, and so that, that large gap I think speaks to what was needed in, in the trading community at this point. But at the same time, I found it to be incredibly validating, right? That 96, 95% of traders like have this kind of knowledge, right? I think if you would, were to look at other industries, take uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, you know, other professions, right? To think that psychology has value in those professions, uh, I think would be grossly kind of underrepresented. And yet it does impact those professions to a large degree, right? I think traders, much like athletes, you know, have been trained to see uh, the impact of uh, their emotions on their decisions, how their thinking can alter their execution. And right. And it's, there's a very kind of clear direct cost that is very often immediate 
And so I think, you know, in large measure, you know, all the other uh, people, uh, you know, the training psychologists, people like yourself, like in the industry, have done a, an incredible service to get traders educated. Right? We don't need to sort of play this game anymore of does psychology have value in trading, yes or no, and, and providing content to that effect. And I think what it does is it helps to reinforce, I think, a lot of what I'm kind of bringing to the table now, which is giving people a way to bridge the gap between, all right, well, I recognize my emotions are affecting me, but I don't have any way of stopping it or, or, or kind of getting over that hurdle to stop greed and FOMO and other fears, fear of failure, fear of mistakes, or confidence issues, discipline issues, right? Affecting those trading decisions. We, we need a, a system to kind of bridge that gap. Or other things, right? That we need more pragmatic strategies. I think that's the, you know, I think what the research has really kind of shown is uh, we can stop educating, and now it's more about the kind of pragmatic work to bridge that gap. That that to me is kind of the nuts and bolts of what the research showed. Yeah, I, I think a lot of traders they look for a strategy or a, or a system as far as the market goes, but there's not many strategies out there to maybe uh, improve your mental game. And in your book you know, the uh, mental game of trading, you, you did outline a strategy. Maybe you can tell us a little bit, little bit about that. Yeah, thanks. John. And I, I, I think you're right. Like th there is a lot of strategies out there for trading. Um, so for me, the trading psychology strategy uh, kind of first and foremost uh, starts with mapping your pattern, right? Profiling out the actual issues that you're having. So list out the mistakes that you commonly make and then take some time before the next time you trade and write out some of the details that typically show up around them, right? You know, let's say it's, uh, you know, you get swept up by, you know, like kind of chatter on Twitter or chatter in a, in a, in a group that you're in and, you know, see other people making money and, you know, you weren't really paying attention to this, you know, one symbol or this market. And all of a sudden now you kind of hyper-focus on it. And, and even though uh, it's not really like a, a setup that you typically would enter, in fact, actually the setup is kind of gone. Uh, you convince yourself that it's okay to kind of jump in late. And so you take that, that scenario and, you know, very clearly, like often it's going to lead to losses, right? You're either going to get stopped out um, or, or it's not going to actually hit a target that was, was making a worthwhile entry. But we, we start to kind of look at the specific thoughts that would come to mind in that scenario. Like what, what, how did you convince yourself that it was valid, even though it wasn't, you know, in, in a, a state of mind that is kind of, you know, more fitting your system? Uh, what emotions were sort of present? What physical signs can you indicate, right? Like you maybe get kind of hyper-focused on, on the chart without actually maybe analyzing all of the factors. You maybe miss a couple. Uh, you convince yourself that it's still valid for, you know, X, Y, or Z reason. Uh, emotion, you know, you can feel your kind of heartbeat, heart, heart rate spike. There's a bit of adrenaline kind of in you. And, and all of that is sort of indicative of the patterns that will happen when you make a mistake. You know, when we think about Right, kind of making sound trading decisions within a system, right? You're you've become very skilled at recognizing patterns and seeing where there is opportunity. Now, those those opportunities aren't guarantees, right? But they they are providing trends, right? And that's you know probabilistically suggesting that there's opportunity here. We want to do the exact same thing for our emotions, right? For our 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 mind, for our uh, the, the sort of signals around the mistakes that you typically make. And so when you take some time to actually write them down write down what was kind of happening in the maybe minutes preceding that. Maybe the thing that wasn't really uh, calculated here is uh, you were down on the day. So on a day where you're actually profitable, you can observe the same kind of chatter on Twitter or chat groups or whatever, and it doesn't sort of spark the FOMO. But now because you're down money, now all of a sudden you're more vulnerable to that. So that becomes kind of part of the pattern. And so recognizing, all right, well, what is it about being down that is going to sort of trigger FOMO? Well, maybe there's some other signals that you can look for. And what happens is as you build this sort of map of your pattern, you begin to be able to make decisions on it. And you can start to avoid making those kinds of mistakes that typically would have just sort of compelled you or get you kind of get swept up into it and don't really know it's a mistake until afterwards. And, you know, if we think about it, it's like, well, making trading decisions happen before the opportunity occurs or kind of at that moment. Where the opportunity strikes, not afterwards. Hindsight does us no good, right? It doesn't help us, right? right that it would have been really cool to buy uh, Bitcoin or Tesla in 2010, right? The fact that is that you didn't, and you have to look at the reasons why and what you could have done differently and analyze, right, to make better decisions in the future, because there will be more opportunities. And the thing is, from an emotional standpoint, from a mental standpoint, 
our behavioral patterns, our thought patterns around our mistakes happen again and again and again in these patterns. And so the more that you're able to kind of understand what those are, the better you're able to actually make decisions before the mistake would typically occur. And that to me is where the power in, in my system kind of comes in, right? Because if you can't see those problems and happening in real time, that you don't really have any real ability to stop it. And, and so I think, I think a lot of traders by and large, you know, kind of have a lot of ideas in their mind, right? They keep it kind of in their head. And the, the biggest problem with that is that your emotional system has the power to actually shut down that part of the brain. So here you are kind of trying to remember everything about your mind, about your mental game, about your mistakes. And yet here's this emotional system that is designed to shut down higher brain function. Cause back when we were, you know, fighting for survival on a day-to-day basis, right? The emotional system was, uh, you know, it, you could die, right? If you were to, th- if you were to stop to think, right? We want fast action and emotions kind of help to produce that. But when it comes to trading, we don't necessarily want fast actions based off of faulty emotional kind of reactions. We want it based on a more balanced present state of mind, one that is actually able to recognize legitimate opportunities, not ones that are, you know, sort of seemingly not there. Right. So what I, what I get, what I'm kind of getting from what you're saying though, is that if you become too emotionally aroused, that it shuts down your ability to recognize you're emotionally aroused. Yes, so you have to exactly. kind of catch it early. Exactly. Right? exactly. Yeah. If you catch it early enough, then yeah, exactly. You can use your brain, but I'll, but I guess the other part too, is that at the end of the day, you don't want to rely on your memory, right? Right. Writing it down, systematizing it, studying it, right helps you to kind of internalize it. So you don't have to rely on your brain to be firing on all cylinders in those, those key moments. You want to be able to, you know, kind of have something you can look at kind of like, you know, the indicators that you would use to make, make trading decisions. Right. Yeah. So you, you have some sort of an emotional indicator so that you make sure you're catching yourself before you get too involved with anything. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 And that's important because we have to make really trading is about making good decisions in the end, right? Making good risk reward and probability decisions. That's and it. You can't you can't do it if your if your emotions are kind of out of whack. Yeah, I think traders fail to kind of think about their decision making process, like the actual act of making decisions as their technique. Right, and this mm-hmm. is sort of a separate kind of uh, line of thinking here. But you know, if I as a golfer, right, my technique in making putts, right, for me was a weak point back twenty five years ago. Right, I didn't fully right. understand what it what it was required. To have a reliable stroke, but you know, in terms of my golf swing from tee to green, I had very sound technique. So even under pressure, I was able to kind of hold up. But under pressure, right, weaknesses get exposed. And so when uh, you know you're making trading decisions and you are liable to uh, you know jump into trades you shouldn't because of FOMO or you know fear kind of keeps you on the sidelines and kind of paralyzes you. Well, well, we could say that, yes, the emotions and, and those um, kind of faulty reactions are part of the problem. The other part of the problem, though, is actually the way in which you make decisions has weaknesses to it, right? There's kind of holes right. in it. Not to say that those holes aren't there when you're in a good state of mind, when you're emotionally balanced. But again, it's relatively weak relative to, compared with, uh, you know, other parts of your decision-making process. So as a trader, right, you can look at the tendencies of the things you forget to consider or the things that you consider in faulty ways. But you can also look at, all right, well, even when I'm making poor decisions, I'm not doing, you know, X, Y, and Z, right? There are aspects of my decision-making that still hold up, which can give you a little bit of confidence, right? Even though you're making mistakes and they can kind of feel bad and and get, you know, a bunch of self-criticism around it, you can get fear, you lose confidence, right? Sometimes you can stabilize all of those emotions by recognizing that there are aspects of your decision-making that is still strong. And your job is just to kind of fill the gap between what is strong and and what becomes weaker in those moments of of kind of high emotion. For some people, it's hard to evaluate their quality decisions because I think a lot of traders underestimate the, uh, the impact of luck basically in your trading results. And, you know, how do we know we've made good decisions but got a bad result or made a bad decision, but got a good result. I think that's another thing. People don't evaluate their, their trades. They win. They only evaluate what they lose. Right. Yeah. Which is why it's important to kind of recognize like what, what does sound decision-making look for you on an ongoing basis? Right. Cause it's easy. I think sometimes to just look at, all right, well, here's what my decision-making looks like when it's at its worst. Right. And if your decisions 
are of that category and you made money, well, then you very clearly got lucky. But as you as you right. kind of study that, well, then it becomes a bit easier to kind of maybe define what like an average decision would look like. Right. And then you can start to look at, all right, well, when I'm actually in a really good kind of zone like state in the flow, um, you know, what, what, did, what do my decisions look like then? What, what factors am I able to consider with greater accuracy or what am I able to consider at all? Um, and, and as you kind of look at that scale, uh, it does become a bit easier to evaluate your decision making process. Right. I think it's it's hard if you don't really have any idea of what, you know, mm-hmm sound decision making looks like for you. But again, you can study any of your own patterning, right? We've talked about studying patterns around your mistakes, but if you study patterns around your good decision making, again, maybe not today, but if you do this, you know, either daily or weekly for a little while, right, eventually you're going to see patterning. And then once you see that patterning, then you'll be able to say, okay, uh, I'm 80% confident that I made a very good decision here. And this loss was due to luck, right? I'm not going to say we're going to be a hundred percent confident, but if you, even just kind of going through that mental exercise will remove some emotion to those losses because now you're just thinking about the role of luck and you're thinking about the role of your decision making in a bit more kind of a, of a pragmatic kind of way. You're not saying, all right, well, that was 100% due to luck, uh, you know, and that loss, and I'm just going to forget about it. Or, you know, it was, I, I know I, I'm absolutely certain I made a great decision there when it's hard to know with absolute certainty, right? Um, and if you leave yourself I think that's a little a- bit open, I think that's an awesome point, Jared, and I love how you put 80%. If you're 100% confident that you made the right decision, then then you have an overconfidence problem, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> you never know. Because you never know. I mean, you, yeah. I, trading is is more complicated than poker. Poker, there's 52 cards for the most part, right, in most games, right? And so the, the variables are more confined, right? The players are sitting at the same table as you. You, you kind of know what the limitations are. In trading, there are so many outside factors that you don't even know exist, let alone have any in, uh, any clear indication that they're, they're they're entering the market. Unless you're, you know, an institutional player with access to resources that most most traders don't. But even then, it's still impossible to know all of the factors because the game can change on a dime. So you know, all of a sudden, we can go from playing no no limit hold'em to playing you know a uh, five card draw, right? And and the game changes right. without you even knowing. You've got cards in your hand. So yeah, so having a hundred percent certainty maybe only happens like years into the future, right? When, when at that point, it's sort of irrelevant to even know. Right, right. I think that's really important. And I think that's a, a good thing that you talk about with trading too, is we have so much information available to us. It's important to know what to pay attention to because you can't pay attention to all of it. Totally, totally. Which yeah. is why, you know, having a very <clears throat> strong, clear strategy or system, I think is actually one of the most important things to having a sound mental game. Right. It's these two, these are, they're not independent factors. I think if you don't have a clear strategy, a lot of times you'll experience fear and anger, greed, loss of confidence, just because you're not certain, right. Around your, around your results. Like if you don't have the ability to get good feedback on a day-to-day basis, it becomes hard to be stable. I mean, I'm at like for me as a golfer, right. If somebody were to blindfold me or prevent me from being able to see where the golf ball went. Right. So I'm on the driving range right. hitting balls and I'm, I, I can't get any more feedback. Right. I, I, I will tell you right now, for the first day, I could actually probably get away with it because my, my, my swing is in tune enough. But day over day, if I'm not getting reliable feedback, the golf ball could be going almost anywhere and I wouldn't fully be able to trust it, let alone be able to go out and compete. So as a trader who daily is getting false feedback, right? Mm-hmm. Wins because eh, the decision was a little off. Losses, no, that was a great decision. Do it again, do it again, do it again. It's like, it's it just it becomes a lot harder to be stable, and then if you add a little bit more uncertainty around what your strategy even is, right? How, how are you getting good feedback? You can't, and so then your entire emotional system is going to be more unstable and more reactive to wins and losses, to outside factors, to FOMO, to uh, you know rapidly moving trades. I mean, you're you're going to be overreactive to P and L and to price movement. Uh, and so that system becomes, I think, the most important thing to then be able, being able to, you know, develop a mental game system. Hey, I see that way too often in trading people being, like you said, people being overreactive to their results where they base their confidence level off of the results that they've had over the last you know month or whatever. And that is, 
you know, and then of course they scale their position size off their confidence level. And then, I mean, have you, um, is that a common problem that you see? Absolutely. And I think you're being yeah. fair by saying it happens over months because sometimes I see it happen over days, right? I mean, traders kind of moving along fine. They're trying to get through a combine. They're, you know, uh, trying to build an account as a part-time job and they have a couple good days and all of a sudden, right? They figured it out. They, they figured it I, out and I got and, it. Yeah. Calculating how much they're going to make this month, calculating what they're going to do with the money. Um, and, you know, yes, the you sort of get, get seduced into thinking that, that your next trades aren't going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> you position size accordingly to that. And then, of course, you're, you've sealed your fate at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's getting that worse. So, commonalities in performance issues across the different fields that you work in. They're all there. I mean, I think it's yeah. just a kind of a, a, a linguistic thing. I mean, greed is a term that's not really used elsewhere, but we would just call it, you know, one of the other problems because at the end of the day, right, greed is, in my opinion, right, just excessive ambition, right? It's it's not like your job is to make money. So to trying to make more money, it's not really a problem, right? We wouldn't say that athletes who are trying to win more championships are greedy, right? That's the, 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 that's what we applaud them. So traders who are trying to make more money, we applaud them as well. However, if you're doing it in a suboptimal way, if you're doing it in a way that is going to actually cost you money in the long run, right, then you're taking on too much risk. And that's where greed is problematic. And so we kind of look at some of the impulses that are going to force you to become kind of overly ambitious in these key moments. Sometimes it can be overconfidence. Uh, sometimes it could just be anger. Uh, but those things exist, you know, kind of in, in every performance environment. But, you know, at the end of the day, right, it's, it's you've got to understand kind of uh, the performance environment with which you're competing in. So I think one of the interesting things with trading as compared with, with golf or poker, right, is that for the most part, you kind of get to decide when the game starts and when it ends. And you get to decide, you know, kind of whether you want to take breaks. I mean, if I'm playing in a golf tournament, I mean, I don't get to choose where and when it's going to happen. You know, if I'm not really feeling great, uh, I can't stop after the third hole. Uh, you know, and that's true. I mean, NBA players, football players, I mean, for the most part, competitive environments, right? The individual person doesn't get to kind of turn that thing on or off because it involves other people who have made decisions as, what, as to whether to turn it you know, on or off. And so right. as a trader, it, I think it's, it provides a great opportunity if kind of viewed from the right perspective, because I think traders by and large, they believe that their role is at like their job is to trade. And so they must be sitting at their terminal, right? Charts ready. Like, and, and if the markets are open that you have to be there and look, if you're working on a prop firm, if you're on a trading desk, right. And it, you are actually getting paid a salary, then we're having a different conversation. Right. But if you are an individual who is trading your own account, your own money, or even if you're in a prop firm, uh, you know, uh, trading somebody else's money, but still kind of on your own time, you need to think about yourself as an athlete who's paid based on your performance. You're not paid mm -hmm. on an hourly basis. So comparing yourself to your friend who's an accountant, to your uh, spouse who is a doctor, I mean, it, it's, it's, not, it's not like a relevant comparison mm -hmm. because the, the, the competitive landscape is not the same. They do not lose money right? If they have a bad day at work, right? Doctors, right. sure. Okay. But they have liability insurance. You don't have insurance right, on your trading decisions, right? So you have to be well-prepared. And if you are genuinely in an emotionally compromised state, if you're too fatigued, if you're burned out, right? Do not trade. Think about like, there, I think sometimes traders fail to kind of calculate the cost that kind of gets baked in. Let, let's just say, uh, you know, because I think burnout is a common problem and it's a common problem in any, any competitive environment. But let, let's just say that you're 20% less efficient in your decision making when you're burned out, right? So you're going to be more vulnerable to uh, kind of jumping in and out of trades, not letting them kind of run to their target, getting in positions that you're not really supposed to be in, um, getting a little bit chopped up. You're still profitable, we'll say, but you're 20% less profitable. Well, how long will that last before it makes sense from a uh, like an actual profitability standpoint for you to take days off. And that actually is you getting paid to take a day off because you're going to come back at hundred percent. And I'm just using those as rough numbers just to, to illustrate the idea that I think traders by and large are not thinking about themselves as performance athletes who are paid 
based on their execution and decision making. And so you need to be thinking about all of the things that go into you being at your best and what does it take for you to be at your best? And then looking at like kind of a rough calculation of like, like how much of a reduction from that level of performance are you willing to accept and for how long before you're taking time off, before you're doing things to, you know, kind of improve your, your mental and emotional functioning. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the big challenges that I see that, you know, kind of gets separated from other performance environments. Cause as a golfer, as a, uh, as a poker player, it's like, you know, when you're going to play, you have a preparation that's fairly uh, reliable and consistent and, you know, just a question of whether you do it or not, but, you know, turning this thing on and off, you know, every day uh, or uh, every working day for a trader is, it can, it, it can be incredibly difficult, especially for those in crypto. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think that's a yeah, fantastic point that you make that, you know, if you look at, well, if somebody has a job, they, a lot of times they don't do anything between the time they go into work <laughs> and the time they leave work, right? They do nothing related to their job. But if you look at any performer, whether it's an actor or a golfer or a sports or whatever, they're taking, you know, if you look at somebody who's, you know, a play, for example, if you go to a play, that, that person has practiced that play for a long period of time. In other words, they've done a lot of work outside the performance, and it's the same thing with a trader, right? If you're expecting to spend all your time at the computer trading and that's all you do, you just, I mean, you're not going to get any better and you're not going to put on a good performance. You need to get in there and you need to do the background work is what you're saying, right? Yeah, well, that, that, that too. Actually, I was saying it more from a, a pure like, all right, let's get you mentally and emotionally ready. But you're, you're expanding it also, right? You need the time to actually practice and develop your competency and build your competency. So, so yeah, like, what does that look like? I mean, athletes, you know, I've, so golfers will typically take, you know, November, December off, um, mm -hmm. baseball, you know, minus a strike season, right. They're going to have months off from the game. So where does that get baked in as a trader, right? If you're going to want to perform at a high level, right. For, for long periods of time throughout the year, right. You need time off. And sometimes you need time to actually like work on skills, uh, you know, to kind of ramp up your, 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 your actual just performance, your, your, your capability. And some traders want to do that sort of cyclically throughout the year. So there's maybe like a month where they take off summertime for them is quieter. So July, they're going to, you know, maybe only kind of log on a couple of days and then come August, maybe they'll start to kind of ramp up some uh, new things uh, from a skill standpoint. Others maybe look at it more quarterly, right? They'll take a week off uh, every quarter. They'll take a week where they are kind of really focused on some new skills, and then they'll kind of integrate those skills over the successive, you know, eight to 12 weeks. Uh, but I think in general, you want to kind of just map out for yourself what, what those cycles look like, because if you are expecting yourself to trade five days a week throughout the entire year without taking any time off, I, I, there's zero, zero chance that you can be as effective as somebody who even just takes off like three weeks throughout the year. I mean, that three time, hours a day <laughs> or whatever, yeah, you know, you know, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Whatever yeah. it is. Like, what does it take to, for you to be at your best? And that's not just a daily decision. It's also, you know, kind of a planning decision around how you're, you're working. Right. And if that goes back and you, you translate that into your mental game, a lot of times the only people, the only time people try to practice mental techniques is while they're actually in front of the computer. <laughs> yeah. And, and when they're tilting, <laughs> when they're angry, when they're, you know, experiencing problems, which is like the last time you need to be prepared for those situations. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. That, that's uh, that's all great stuff. Now you have this new masterclass coming up. Yeah. So you yeah. want to, do you want to share about that? Sure. Yeah. So this is uh, in partnership with a organization called Trader Lion. They've, they've done a few other uh, webinar type things. And so this is going to be like kind of a five part uh, workshop uh, webinar series online. Um, it'll be two hours uh, each uh, webinar slash workshop, probably a little bit longer with, with Q and A. Um, and really it's designed to kind of bring, you know, my book and my material to life and really kind of workshop it. So, you know, I mentioned step one of the, uh, of the system is mapping your pattern. So, you know, I've got tools and worksheets that I use with clients to actually do that. Those are going to be, you know, kind of, kind of me in the, in the trenches working with a lot of people at once trying to educate them on how to actually build out a very good profile and actually make it solid enough that it's reliable that day after day, you can look at it and say, ah, okay, I am vulnerable for greed because I've started looking at my P and L, right. And I only start to look at P and L 
when I'm now focused more on money than I am on quality of decision making. And so, you know, having a really good pattern uh, profile of those patterns uh, mapped out is, is, is essential. Uh, step two is called uh, getting to the root of your problem, right? So understanding the actual cause of those problems, you know, I've got tools and, and processes to, to kind of figure out uh, what those are. And then uh, developing a, a real-time strategy uh, is, is sort of the next part. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll be looking at kind of uh, planning for the future and helping to effectively kind of build a system that you can use again and again and again to solve any of the mental and emotional problems that you experience uh, in trading. And over these five, uh, you know, uh, webinars, uh, eight weeks in total, to me, the idea is to basically teach traders, you know, kind of how to become a mechanic for themselves, right? If we think about the mental game as being like an engine to a car with a lot of moving parts, you know, very often, you know, traders just get overwhelmed by, you know, you open up your hood. If you don't know what you're looking at, it just looks like a, a jumbled mess. And so as, as your kind of uh, resident uh, mechanic, uh, I'm going to teach you kind of how to actually look at uh, you know, aspects of your mental game in a way that will help you to actually kind of troubleshoot uh, some very basic problems, which by and large covers a large majority of, of traders. Of course, there's always sort of the atypical, you know, really tough cases that are out there. But for the most part, uh, you know, you'll be able to kind of be armed with a, a, a system to be able to solve your own problems, you know, into the future. And uh, and that's really kind of the aim of it is, is basically uh, working with a lot of people all at once and giving them almost like a one-on-one -on -one coaching experience, you know, but kind of in the trenches working together uh, on this. I find we all have the same general problems. So I think group setting works well and you can hear that other people, you're not alone, basically. Other people have similar issues. For sure. Yeah. And I think sometimes even I've seen this with, with clients, right? Um, you often get a different perspective when you hear about a problem from somebody else too, right? It's not even just the, I, I agree with you, the ability to kind of know that you're not alone is huge. So many traders work independently, right? And they're not even, you know, kind of tuned into what others are struggling with. Um, but then when you hear problems kind of posed in different ways, it kind of helps you to, to map your own problem, right? It helps you kind of understand what's, it's like, oh, okay, well, no, that's not me. That is me. And just sometimes the not me is important. Um, yeah, the not problem. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, people read my books and it's like, well, I have everything. I'm like, no, you don't. Right? It feels like it that way because it seems very familiar. But when you start to really think about, all right, what are the biggest problems? Well, that's a different question, right? right? And the biggest problems are, are really the where where we try to start because, you know, if you if you kind of nail down that stuff, it oftentimes takes care of a lot of the smaller stuff. Yeah, right. <clears throat> you take away the big the big issue, and then everything just filters down. Yeah. yeah awesome. Exactly. Yeah. So before we go, maybe some general advice you have for traders. Yeah, I mean, I think the mapping your pattern is, is an essential one. Um, I think in general, um, if you have a, a clear understanding of what it takes for you to prepare well, um, that I, I think is one of the most essential kind of under um, appreciated tools, right? Traders obviously, you know, go through their pre-market prep and they, they do so fairly consistently. But if you were an athlete, um, and your job was to perform, you know, in this NBA game, in this NFL game, right? Your, your, the warm up that you'd have, the, the, the preparation that you would go through would be very systematic. Now, the, the, what you kind of focus on may change, but I think it's vital that traders have very clear structure in their, uh, in their pre market prep. Um, that also includes mental game prep, right? So you're reviewing the map of your pattern, you're understanding kind of what, battles lie kind of internally that you've got to deal with. And maybe they're not necessarily going to show up today, but you need to be prepared for them because you don't know when they're going to show up. And that's the whole point. Right. And so kind of taking time, you know, to, to get yourself mentally prepared doesn't guarantee that you're going to actually be able to, to uh, solve what comes your way, but it pretty much makes it more likely that you will be able to. And then if you're not right, then you can kind of capture more information about what was going on, better understand maybe the cause of it because you were more tuned in and more ready for it versus kind of being on the back, on your back foot, you know, maybe hoping that it's not going to show up today or just not even thinking about it, which is almost more problematic. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're talking about one step at a time and constant improvement. And, you know, as. Yeah. I mean, there is, there, there is kind of no other way and, and, you know, creating that sort of cycle, right. You know, it gets yeah. tighter when, when you're well-prepared. 
Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, Jared. That was some fantastic uh, interview, and, and uh, I, I appreciate you coming on. Before you go, do you want to mention how we can get a hold of you? Sure. Yeah. Uh, JaredTenler.com uh, uh, my website. There's information on the, the masterclass, um, you know, my books, um, coaching. Uh, there's also lots of free downloadable worksheets. Um, so anything you kind of want to use with my system is, is sort of there for free. Um, and I'm, a, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So uh, at Jared Tendler uh, is where you can reach me. And I'm active and also available to answer questions. I always love, um, you know, being able to help people out and public forums like that. It's, it's a, uh, it's pretty cool. All right. That's awesome. Well, thank you. And I uh, hope we get to speak again soon. Yeah, of course. John. Great to, great to see you again. Thanks so much. Good to see you. Yep. Trade well, everyone. And that is what I have for you today. I hope you consider purchasing Jared's book. It's an excellent book on trading performance and I highly recommend it. Also, if you have any questions or comments or anything else you'd like to see on the next trading performance podcast, please write that in the comments and I'll answer any questions for you personally. Thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Trading Performance Podcast.